opposition case in one night, I, think, I do not think the judiciary is the right organ to tackle this. The right organ to tackle this is, are the people. The people have elected a parliament. If that parliament is not legislating in your favor and legislating laws that you agree with, don't elect them again. Elect a different party. If you only have three options, create a fourth. Is the judge or is a specific judge, a chief justice, supposed to step in when parliament is not doing its job to the fullest or to its best capacity? I don't know if that's the answer. I don't think it's the correct answer, simply for, well, for five reasons that I'm going to kind of talk to you about today. But um, on a very superficial level, I think that issues that exist within parliament are not completely shuttered off. Everything in parliament is not privileged. Yes, what you speak about in parliament is privileged, but the laws that are actually implemented, they're not privileged laws. You can have them, you can have them rediscussed, you can have them revamped, because you pick the politicians that represent you. So if you don't agree with the law that a politician is enacting, you do not in, um, elect that particular politician again. And so the system of checks and balances in a democracy is very famously called for the people, by the people, and of the people. It's not called for the judges, by the judges, and of the judges. then we would be electing Saki Prasar as our next Prime Minister. And I think we might be doing that soon at the rate we're going, but I think that's for you to decide. Um, so, uh, there are five things that I'd like to talk about today. And the first is that the current judicial activism in Pakistan is threatening the separation of powers. The second is that it's anti-democratic. The third is who will judge the judges. The fourth is that it does not lead to better outcomes in terms of public interest or human rights. And the fifth is that it's basically strengthening the military over and over again. So you all must have heard about, or if you read the news about uh, a recent case of Yusuf Salim, who was um, a blind lawyer who ranked one, number one out of 300 in the recent exams uh, for civil judges. And he was interviewed and uh, he was asked, well, in Pakistan, for instance, specifically in courts, you have a lot of corruption, you have a lot of dhanvi left, right, and center, so in terms of people get judges to sign off on things that, don't, uh, that aren't passed to the law. A lot of what a judge does is ascertain on the face of the victim, on the face of the defendant. That's part of justice, you determine through the demeanor of those in front of you on the podium. They asked a blind man, how are you? How will you determine these things? And he said, well, I can ask the person next to me to determine it for me or to tell uh, me what, what is going on. And whereas it truly appealed to me, and I truly feel for him, and I truly feel for Saki Bittar for taking this up at a small motor notice, the question before us today is, is that really Saki Bittar's job? Or is that really any Chief Justice's job? So can, is it your job, for instance, to issue a small motor notice when a funeral is being carried out of a lane that is flooded with water? Or is that supposed to be addressed by the parliamentarian in that area? If he's not doing it, I agree that's a problem with democracy, then we him out, as I suggested. Is it a chief justice's job to be addressing the nation on dirty drinking water in certain areas, or to get, get GO employees their salaries, if it is not being directly brought to his notice through a petition or through a suit, not on a suit, a petition. Um, if it hasn't been brought to him, where does that sue more power or where should it stop? And that brings me to my first point, which is the threatening of the separation of powers that we've been spoken to about. The whole point of a three-tenant democracy with an executive, a legislator, and a judiciary is that each organ is supposed to check the other. <coughs> now, a system of checks and balances, as we've spoken about, means that you check each other, but you do not enter into each other's domain. Because once you enter in each other's domain, you simply have no boundaries. Once you have no boundaries, it's a slippery slope. Because today, Sakib Nassar is entering into the political sphere and the political domain. Tomorrow, what if Parliament starts saying, well, we don't agree with the judgments that are passed in court. And simply because we, as a majority of uh, several hundred people disagree, we're not going to let the courts do their job. So, in fact, this is not going to happen, but it's hypothetically, it's very problematic. Because when you have a system with three tenets, effective, as we've spoken to, we've spoken to about, um, there is a certain system that you're guided by, which is the rule of law and the constitution. 
And when uh, the first speaker of the opposition spoke to us and said, well, what if Parliament decides to start to remove abrogate the democracy or start killing people, or I forget what it was exactly, you have a constitution that is guiding Parliament. What a judge's limit is to be is that constitution. And um, if, you, if you read a judge's rule of conduct that guides them, is they are supposed to interpret and they are supposed to um, interpret the will of the legislature. So they are not supposed to rewrite and reread the law. And now, for instance, like I'm not going to name judges, but I'm from the Sindh High Court um, from Sindh, and there are certain judges who are now being elevated to the Supreme Court, going to be the next Chief Justice of Pakistan in a couple of years, who are rereading provisions of the law based on what has been presented to them and arguments that they like. Whereas I agree that that's a very uh, sort of savvy way, savvy way of looking at things. If the legislature intended for a provision to be read in that manner, interpreted in that manner, they would have explicitly said so. When they don't say so, the question arises, is it a judge's job to fill in the gap? And when there are certain gaps that can be filled in, I think the problem arises when you start completely taking the law into your own hands, which um, I will just move on to tell you why that's problematic. Which my second point is that it's anti-democratic, which I've already talked to you about a little bit, because we trust parliament. We elect, as uh, we speak, so we have 97,000 people elected the first speaker of the opposition. Those 97,000 people trust him. They do not trust X, Y, Z judge to rewrite the law for them. And as I said, they would have elected him if they wanted him to do so. Um, and in a lot of the cases that are now being now being decided in the Supreme Court. Chief Justice, for instance, says, well, since Parliament didn't do so, I will do so for you. But that's inherently very problematic, because if Parliament didn't do so, it should be given the chance to do so in the future. Either a motion should be passed, or someone should bring up a case before them that is addressed. Um, and so, on the provisions of law that we were talking to about 199 and 184.3, yes, these provisions exist to bring matters before the court. And I'm not saying that court should have no importance or completely be sidelined. If a case is brought to a judge under these provisions, then we should jolly well hear the case. But so more notice is extremely <coughs> and problematic if you're going to be hearing or taking matters into your own hands left, right, and center that have not been brought to your notice. With 184.3 and 199, like the case, for instance, about Nawaz Sharif, it was brought by Nan Khan under 184.3 to the uh, Supreme Court. Therefore, Sakhi Nisar and the other, well, not Sakhi Nisar, the other judges were able to hear it. If a case is not brought to your notice and you're bringing every political issue into your purview, you're treading on very, very treacherous waters because you're moving into the domain of the legislator and the executive. And as, uh, as we've been talking about, each organ is to check each other. Which brings me on to my fourth point. Um, sorry, my third point. Uh, sorry. Who will, the third point is, who will judge the judges? And the issue here arises is that with the Apex Court and the Supreme Court, if Saki Pesara or any other judge passes a judgment, who's gonna, who is going to question them? Who is going to judge their conduct? Now, for instance, today, uh, or rather yesterday, he passed a judgment saying that if you're in contempt of court, you, are, uh, you can be imprisoned for life. Something like this is extremely problematic simply because. One man has decided this is how the law should be. And things like this, and, and if, if he crosses the line, which for instance, for many of us, he appears to be doing so, and you have a district and sessions judge that said that he is uh, misconducting himself, that judge got suspended. So who's going to check for this apex court judge? Who's going to check um, any Supreme Court justice if they sit at the top? Anything you say against them is a scandalous statement. And this law, um, the law of scandalizing the judiciary, has been interpreted very, very, very narrowly in England. So there was one case in 1931, there was one case about six years ago, but judges in England are away from interpreting this law simply because it, it's very problematic. You're basically saying that anything that's said to a judge is sacred. Like you cannot, not, um, everything is off limits. And it's also extremely problematic because if you have a judge like Sakhi Nassar, he is, he is supposed to be, um, he is supposed to be organized by the judge's code of conduct, or he is supposed to conduct himself in accordance with that. The judge's code of conduct has two articles, Article 2 and Article 5, that I personally think he's in grave violation of. 
What does Article 5 say? Article 5 says that the Supreme Court judge should not engage in any public controversy, least of all on a political question, notwithstanding that it involves a question of law. So even if there is a question of law before a Supreme Court judge, if it is a political question, he is in misconduct if he takes up the issue. And I'm going to ask all of you, staff, money, um, any other issues taken up, is it a political question or not? I mean, the answer is pretty clear. They're all political issues that he is getting himself involved in. <laughs> the, yes, sir. Uh, your, your fundamental rights, health, education, water, these are not political issues. These are issues enshrined in your constitution that have to be brought to people. If the system rejects them and the CJP takes an issue or notice of this, how is that political or unconstitutional? exactly sure what you mean by if the system rejects them. If the system is not providing you these um, is, is not providing you these particular rights, yeah, i.e. education and that takes you back to the fact that how politicians choose to allocate their funds, it may not be perfect. It may go for instance in Lahore if um, the politicians may be spending all their money on roads. Less money may be going to health and education. That is a matter of allocation that political party chooses. If you have a problem with that, I agree, take issue with it, but don't elect them again. That's the, that is how a democracy feels with it. So I guess I'm out of time, but my last issue, which was the fact that the military rule continues, is that by allowing judges like Sapu Pissar and the Chief Justice of Power to make the laws for you, you are effectively not that parliament staff to deal with you know, to deal with these very problematic issues. If you send the laws back to Parliament, Parliament would have to be more rigorous with its rights creating methods, with its with, with being more accountable to you. Effectively what you're now doing is saying, well, okay, let the judiciary deal with it, our politicians get off the hook repeatedly. We always let them get off the hook. What happens then? The military steps in to take control because the judiciary gets too strong and, it, and that's what happened, for instance, with Iftikhar Chaudhary. The judicial activism, he disposed of 6,000 slow motor cases in his tenure. Um, the number of his own cases that were pending were up to 30,500. He did not look at those. He just disposed 6,000 slow motor. What happened? Musharraf got annoyed, jumped in. And to have this vicious cycle of a dictator coming in and checking the democracy. The only way for democracy to succeed is by weeding out its own weeds. And I think the people are now intellectually informed, technologically informed, and just informed in general about world issues. We don't need one man who we have not elected to take over for us. We have ourselves and we have uh, MNAs.